I have always been inclined to wander, both in my mind and with my feet. When I lived in the city, I'd follow the banks of the Thames and the Kelvin, till my knees ached and I wasn't quite sure how to get home. Now that I live by the coast, almost all my meandering takes me east or west along the shore, gathering wood for the fire and sand to fill my shoes. But every now and then, I set off inland to gather brambles and pine cones in the woods and explore the neat, prosperous fields of my adopted county. When my senses feel assaulted by the wires of modern life, there's a place where I like to take my retreat. A farm just a few miles away with red barns and a low stone shop. Just when you think you'll scream if you see another frozen thing covered in breadcrumbs, you can wander up the long, straight, beach-lined lane to feed the hens and dig up your own carrots. In the makeshift cafe, there's a bowl of soup made from whatever there was too much of in the field. Ruddy young men will take your children on tractor tours, driving through streams for maximum squeals, before telling them in sober tones how best to harvest a crop. But just before you get to the hens, there's a blousy herb garden, where rosemary grows to such a height that it almost obscures the small tent at the centre of the garden. On cold days, smoke drifts from a thin steel flue. Early on the first frosty Sunday morning of last year, I slipped off my shoes and stepped inside the tent. Feeling uneasy and queasy and worried about the ingredients and side effects of the potions and creams I used to tame my angry, irritated body, I'd seen a leaflet about a day of studying essential oils and I'd come to the tent to learn how we can use them to help ourselves and our families. I'd brought my big blue hardback notebook with me and if I needed glasses, I'd have had those pressed firmly back on my nose. I sat cross-legged on a softly worn paisley pattern cushion as close as I could to the already lit stove. First lesson, how to introduce yourselves to the oils. In the half-light of the tent, the quiet disturbed only by the shuffle of wood in the stove and the occasional cluck from the field, I slowed my breathiness to a measured in and out so that no inward gasp would draw the scents too sharply past the nerve endings in my nose. The teacher produced her basket filled with dark, diminutive vials. As she selected a bottle, she wrapped a tissue disguise around its label before sprinkling a few drops of each oil on thin pieces of paper and passing them to us. We wafted them backwards and forwards beneath our noses and she asked us to say what the aromas made us think of, then to say what we thought they might be good for, what they might fix. Some easy ones to start with. There's no mistaking the icy blast of peppermint, and it's not a huge leap to guess that it might bring solace to someone suffering from a cold. We learned about bass notes and mid notes and top notes, and my heart leapt for all those top notes. The citrus bursts that wake me from my habitual lethargy. My smile widened with each sniff of grapefruit and sweet orange, and I carefully wrote down their uses. A tonic for the liver and the skin, a lowerer of blood pressure, lavender as first aid. The teacher said, keep a bottle in your bag for cuts and grazes. Your bag will smell amazing and you'll find people come to you for help when they're hurt. I rushed out after the class to get this vital vessel, and while I've had it in my bag for a while now, the bag still smells of socks and old biscuits, and I haven't noticed a stream of casualties at my side. I suspect that it's the teacher's lissom beauty that attracts the injured parties, rather than the soothing fragrance emanating from her bag. But as I was floating on this blissful cloud of zest, my nose sensed a dark shadow passing overhead. I didn't like the smell of the latest oil, and when I sniffed at it, pictures started to form in my mind of flowers and wood. 
I wasn't sure why they were unwelcome. Who doesn't like flowers? And wood is usually considered a warm and friendly substance. But as the images came into focus, I could see rather too clearly a polished wooden coffin with wreaths of flowers on the top. I couldn't think why anyone would want an oil that smelled like a funeral. And my drowsy warm limbs started to tense, toes curling in as my fingers made protective fists. When I told the others what I could see, the teacher said the oil was elang elang and that it was known for unblocking feelings. A student said I should come to another Sunday in the tent, a day specially designed to help you get in touch with your deepest feelings. A day where you get those pictures out of your subconscious and look at them. And though I know these shards are buried in a very shallow grave, for the moment I'm happy to leave them there, with their covering of leaves keeping them safe. So I half smiled them a maybe and hid the crumpled paper under my cushion. While the rest of the oils brought pictures of sunny yellow kitchens filled with fruit or piles of snowy linen on cedarwood shelves, there was one last surprise in this heady mix. As I held the oil sprinkled paper to my nose, in my mind, I flew up. The clouds dissolved and the mercury rose till I found myself walking along a coastal promenade, Mediterranean pines reaching out from the rocky outcrops, the sun just starting to set behind them. It's Italy, of course, and I'm just in time for the aperitivo. After a day of dawdling disguised as study, there's time for one drink before going back home to change for the evening. A spindly glass of Prosecco, decades before British women chose it as an essential food group, taken outside, watching the boats lazily clinking together in the harbour. The waiter, too handsome for table waiting in any other country, brings a plate of black olives and fresh capers and tiny squares of bread dripping with olive oil and rosemary. The teacher cuts in with, Yes! Mediterranean rosemary! But I'm back in the bar, my sunburned shoulders starting to tingle as the light fades to pink. There must have been endless months of Glasgow rain when I was at university, since that's where I took my degree. But when I look back, all I can see are these languid summers of learning by absorption. Even the winters looked like summer. With a brace of dictionaries in my tote bag, I was propping up the bar in Geneva, Provence and Florence, when others were trudging through Hull or Lille. A prematurely seasoned traveller by air, I would watch the other female passengers with more than a little interest. I would see the confident, expensive Euro wives, the British girls who'd worked in Strasbourg and married a local. Breezing through passport control, deciding at the last moment which passport to use, duty-free bags bursting at the seams with Chanel. These were the kind of women whose husbands got them a Hermes scarf as a little extra for Christmas, who removed one chunky gold earring to chat on the phone, who wouldn't think of anything less than Bali for their daughter's tiny black patent shoes. I watched them because I fully expected that they were my future that I would glide seamlessly from able linguist and part-time socialite to competent, glossy matron taking my bilingual kids home to see their grandparents three times a year, with framed photographs of us in ski suits, packed in the suitcase along with the champagne and the giant Toblerone. And when I think of the girl that I was then, a girl making room in her bottom drawer for the silk squares and the cashmere cardigans, I wonder what she would make of the woman I am now, the almost quite grown up version of myself. I think she'd have a few questions to ask. What happened? Why are you still living in Scotland? You don't seem to have any money. 
Couldn't you have made it work with that merchant banker? Passion fleets, Emma. They all lose their hair in the end, and at least he would have taught you to drive. Why does everything stink of geranium? Have they stopped making Chanel number 19? Is that folk music? And how did you manage to forget the Italian word for just about everything? Breakfast was supposed to be peaches and croissants and sputtering black coffee. And look at you now, standing there every morning, stirring porridge and looking out of the window, a rusty old kettle whistling and whining. I thought that we had plans. What happened? And why are you so happy?